Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Allison Park Leadership Podcast. I'm one of your hosts. My name is Dave. And my name is Jeff. Of course, we're father and son. I'm the lead pastor at Allison Park Church. Dave is the campus pastor at uh, the Northside Campus. And we are into year four of year our four. podcast. Come on. Can you on. believe we started this in the middle of the pandemic? And yeah, we it were was largely on Zoom. We were on Zoom. I think the first couple episodes we were there because we hadn't really interacted in person much because we were all locked down. I know. And uh, sound quality wasn't great. Um, we were getting our rhythm. I was actually just with uh, one of our listeners, Joe Osborne, give a little shout out to Joe. Uh, and he said, uh, man, you guys have really found your stride with the pro- podcast. Early on, it was sort of like a, kind of a, like you were sort of figuring out how to interact with each other. But now, <laughs> like he said, it's just really good. They interaction that you have. You have a good routine, a good rhythm, good rapport with each other. So thank you, Joe. And we don't have any five-star reviews today, do we? Do No, but I do want to say, in case you have been a listener for all three years heading into year four, thank you so much for your support. Mm -hmm. And even if you're brand new, we just want to welcome you as a part of the podcast. We always say that we discuss the principles behind the plans because we are we really want to talk a little bit more about the why we do things philosophically and I guess theologically in church is more than we just want to, you know, answer questions. Yeah, when when we started this, I think that my uh, idea was if we could talk about some things that were more strategic, value oriented, uh, especially for the Allison Park Church staff, that it would help them to get uh, aware of some things that maybe we hadn't been talking about um, enough in staff meetings because we were always on the practical. But then I think what happened was we got into... Uh, we really do our best on controversial issues, right? When we talk about stuff that people either are wondering about, like aliens in the Bible, or or we talk about something significant to our world today, like politics or social issues, or we're talking about something theological. And uh, you guys have been feeding us really great questions and, and content to discuss. So this is really, we fi- I think we found our rhythm and our niche in doing that. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So we just want to say thank you. And we always usually start off by thanking anybody who left us a five-star review in Apple Podcasts because yep. we can actually see your name on there. You can do it on Spotify as well. No new ones to report this week, but we would love to shout you out. Uh, so if you can just even do that right now, that'd be such a huge help towards yes. helping us spread the word. Um, today, I'm really excited. So this is actually take two. <laughs> <laughs> we we did this yesterday and realized we had a... Some kind of we had a really era. great discussion without the camera or the microphones on. So hopefully so, this is our best yeah. version. <laughs> I didn't think go. you were going to tell anybody that. No, huh? I think it's funnier to, to, to admit it. Yeah, but so today we got a really great discussion we're excited for. Uh, our, our working title is, Why Has the Church Gone Silent on Hell? Mm. And, man, it's it's a pretty somber topic. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we'll talk. We'll, we'll talk today in the podcast about hell and what it is, and is it real, and you know, how do we respond to it? But I think we we can probably just start by acknowledging you seem to hear a lot less about hell today from a church perspective than maybe you used to, for better or for worse. But have you noticed any of that? Yeah. I, so I think one of the reasons is why you just mentioned it, and it is you know God's judgment and eternal punishment and life after death and uh, all very intense topics. So we typically like to have a lot of fun on a podcast like this. This is one of those podcasts where uh, when you start to think about the subject matter, it is uh, really sobering, gripping. Um, But yeah, I think in my era, when I was growing up, the idea of hellfire and brimstone preaching was much more common. And I think now there is either a hesitance about it, an ignorance about it, or an outright just denial of the idea. Um, people, A lot of people have just crossed it off the list because there's a question that people often have, which is, how could a good God send people to hell? Right. And so that is such a complicated issue that anytime you bring it up in a sermon or a message or in a, in a life group, um, you with that is that corollary th- corollary thought that no one is prepared to address, and so it's therefore like the elephant in the room theological idea that is often avoided. I also think there's a second reason, and that is probably in the '90s there was a move towards churches becoming much more relevant to a, a broken, unchurched world, and an emphasis in messages that were more 
preaching toward people's felt needs. And uh, of course, there is a there is a felt need of one day you're going to die and stand before God. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but it that doesn't fit into the typical categories of you know, how to handle your stress, how to be a better parent, right, common how, to, ground. how to work on your marriage. Right. Yeah. So you're going to, you're going to build common ground with an audience coming in. And if they come in for the very first time and you hit them with, you're going to hell, you know, <laughs> there is a lake of fire. There, there is a, a feeling like, man, is that the right thing to do? Is that the right approach? And it doesn't really fit with the current move or what has been the move to more do felt need preaching. Yeah. Yeah. I think, so we were talking about this. I, I think that for for better or for worse, maybe for worse in a lot of cases, for hundreds of years, the the problem that was presented with Christianity is someday you're going to die and you're going to go somewhere. Yeah. And most of you are going to hell. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. And it was like, the problem is this. The solution is Jesus. And guess what? If you pray this prayer, mm. then when you die, at least you're not going to spend eternity in this horrible torture chamber full of burning fire. And I mean, we were talking about this. It seems like for for a minute that that worked, you know, even okay, if it so had downsides. I think it, it, it uh, let's just say uh, some of it is knowing your audience. So for several hundred years in the United States, we had a very Judeo-Christian influenced world where people started with an agreement with God's law, an awareness of sin, and a, a, an awareness that we're, we're broken. Okay, so... In the 1970s and early 80s, there was probably the primary way we trained people to do evangelism. I was trained in this was a methodology called evangelism explosion, where you would go door to door again, different era, different generation. And the way you would start the conversation is you would say, um, if you were to die tonight, uh, let's say you were, you know, you were driving your car, you're in an accident and you were to die tonight. Do you know where you would spend eternity? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? And if somebody said, I don't know, well, then you would say, well, here's how you can know. And you would give them the, so that was the starter question. Yeah. Are you going to heaven that or hell? That was the opener. That was the opener. Hi, nice to meet you. Are you going to hell tonight? <laughs> yes. Yes. And let me yeah. tell you how you can avoid hell. And so that, but that was the preaching people were used to. Billy Graham preached that way. And this is how so many people came to Christ. And, um, you know, this goes back as a part of the all of the great awakenings in the United States of America, the first one, which happened in the 1700s, which was led by um, a minister in New England by the name of Jonathan Ed Edwards, his most famous sermon, which most people believe launched the great awakening mm -hmm. was a message called sinners in the hands of an angry God. Think yeah. about this. It was a way longer title than that. And it, it was a, a, a message that emphasized, okay, here was his primary illustration you are like an insect, like a spider being held over a, a, a burning flame. And God, by his grace, has not dropped you in yet. But if you don't repent and get right with God, any moment he could drop you in and you would be consumed by the fires of hell. You need to repent. And when people heard this message, they fell on their faces and they cried out to God for mercy. And this became part of what was the first great awakening in our country. Now, the message was way more balanced than what I just described. However, the imagery and the conviction that came with that was this idea that God is angry at you, hell is your punishment, and you should be there right now. <laughs> and so a lot of times people, uh, preachers, preached almost with joy that that <laughs> you know kind of that idea you deserve hell yeah <laughs> yes. yeah which which is not untrue it's not untrue but the tone was sort of that intense thing well your generation does not relate to that at all mm. now we're in a post post christian culture yeah. that is in many ways uh, angry about christianity and so to come at it from the very first day with are you going to heaven or hell m most people wouldn't even necessarily believe there is such a thing let alone want to talk to someone who's going to start the conversation with them with that particular issue. Yeah. So I think the culture's changed, which requires a change of approach. And maybe, and I think this is what we're going to get into a little bit, maybe we haven't had the most biblical view of heaven and hell and the imagery that's been part of the heritage of what we've known in this country maybe isn't as accurate biblically yeah. in the way that, it, that we see it. And, and so I think what we want to do is get back to Scripture, and we're going to talk about it from that point of view, right? Yeah, I, I think that is a barrier. I, I think when you're talking about 
um, why is the church gone silent on hell? Part of the reason is if you talk about hell, you do need to explain so much yeah. because it immediately brings a bunch of images to your head. Right. I mean, there are it, it's it's now in secular culture. Here's what heaven is. Here's what hell is. And a lot of times there's all these shows that are like heaven and hell, neither is really good or bad. It's just a mm. war between two opposing forces and there's bad angels and there's good demons. Yeah, it's a know. syncretism. It's a sort of a mushy theological mixture of a bunch of different theologies into one that when you really start to dissect, it doesn't make much sense. Right. Yeah. And, and then so you'll have the white guys, the wh guys in the white robes, not the white guys, the white the <laughs> guys in the white robes of the harps yeah. and the guys in the red suits of the pitchforks and they're, they're yeah. going at it and just, you know, it just depends on who wins. It's yeah. Really and, and so we have a really bad, I, so I think a lot of our thinking about heaven and hell comes out of the middle ages. It comes more out of the middle ages than it comes out of the scriptures. Right. Yeah. And it has to do with some of the depictions of things called Dante's Inferno, which describe the what is it? Seven levels of hell or nine yeah. levels or whatever it was. Nine, yeah. And, and, uh, and then you have this really incomplete view. So people view heaven in sort of a, you know, saccharine way, kind of this, you know, here I am in a white robe on a cloud with a harp and a halo board. <laughs> right. In an eternal church service. <laughs> in an eternal church that service. I'm stuck in. That's yeah. our view of heaven. And hell is, a devil, a red devil with horns and a tail and a pitchfork and fire blazing behind him. And, a, and, and I remember guys I grew up with who would be like, I, I don't want to go to heaven and be bored up with all those religious folks. I want to go to hell and party with my friends. Like, yeah. like it's a place that might be hot, yeah. <laughs> but at least it's going to be fun. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so I don't think that represents what the scripture presents to us at all. No. And so, you know, I have a lot of people who have relatives who die who they believe are in heaven, and they'll come to me and say, Pastor, tell me what does the Bible actually say about heaven? And I think we're going to do a second episode, a follow-up to this, which will talk about the idea of heaven. But a lot of people don't have real good grasp on what the Bible says about heaven or hell, which yeah. is a big problem. And I think there is a way for the church not to be silent about it. But let's just face it, if there is no hell, if there is no judgment for sin, if there is no justice in the world, then we live in a very unfair place. And the cross of Jesus makes no sense because Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sin so that we could avoid the consequences of sin and the punishment that comes with it. And so Christianity is not truly Christianity without the concept of hell. Mm -hmm. But it, it isn't, I don't think, the, always the way that we um, the, the, the think about it because we don't have good biblical training on what hell really is. So we're going to talk about that today. Yeah, and before we get into some of the specifics now, well, let's plug the podcast. We I was about to say that. Yeah, go ahead. So one of the one of the resources that that I guess at least me, I think you as well, yes, are definitely. most sort of geeked about th this year and in the last <laughs> couple of years is a, a resource called the Bible Project, which is yeah. led by Tim Mackey and John Collins. And uh, Tim Mackey, who you know has I think several PhDs in Semitic languages and all this stuff, he had a, a sort of a little side podcast he did. Uh, it was called Exp Exploring My Strange Bible, which is like a collection of his lectures and teachings. And he did, in 2017, at least they released um, a four-part series Yes, where he did a really, really good in-depth teaching on heaven, hell, and the afterlife. And so yes. if you would like an amazingly deep explanation of heaven and hell and what the what the bible really believes about death and what the bible believes about mm -hmm. you know our our permanent state of existence and, and where people go when they die right now and the future resurrection of things by the way you said deep deep but not boring no really not okay boring. in depth is probably a better way to say it it isn't boring so tim uh, is actually the guy that uh, you know we're recommending Allison Park Church this year does a Bible reading plan on you version called the Bible Project. Tim is the same guy that does those little video clips that are animated that give us perspective on the passages that we're reading. So those of you that are in the Bible reading plan, you'll know this is the same guy, and uh, he provides balanced, effective, in-depth teaching on this idea of heaven and hell. And we're going to touch on some of those concepts here. But if you find what we are saying today confusing or incomplete, please go to 
Uh, I think the titles are Heaven and Hell. Yeah. Uh, it, that's the title of those four episodes. Yeah, that we, we can try to link it somewhere. Um, but yeah, it was, on the show notes today. But if you go to Exploring My Strange Bible Podcast, mm-hmm. it's like September 2017, yeah. and, and it'll be Heaven and Hell. So enough stalling. Let's get into the content. So what does the Bible teach about Heaven and Hell? Let's start so there, Dave. I will start by saying I think everything we're going to talk about is going to not do justice to what <laughs> you could get. I mean, we're going to give, I think, yeah. enough to give a summary. Um, but one place that I think we have to start with, and this is what this is sort of where Tim starts. He says there's a traditional view that's somewhat based in culture, somewhat based in the Bible, that's not totally wrong, but it is mm-hmm. incomplete. Yeah, when we're talking about heaven and hell, and and we talk about like death and the afterlife. The traditional thought about how all this works is that um, you know you live your life and then you die, and then there's a surprise twist, boom, you're going one of two places, maybe you didn't know about this, mm. and there's this moment he calls the password moment. Um, <laughs> did you pray a prayer? So you stand at the pearly gates with Simon Peter, and you get asked the magic question, and you have to have the right answer yes. to go through the right door, and typically you see in cartoons an elevator that leads up into the clouds, yeah. or one that leads down Out into the flames. pits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and, and the password moment for, for us evangelicals would be, did you pray a prayer of salvation? Right. Right. But there's also some denominations have where you baptized or yeah. there's things like that. Well, and the, and so it, there is a place this comes from in the scriptures in Revelation 20. It tells us when there is this moment of final judgment, the great white throne, we stand before God, the books are opened, and everyone's name who's not found written in the book of life is cast into a, a fire. Okay, so it, there is a root of w- where we get this from, but then that is sort of um, overproduced in a way. Uh, leaving out a lot of other thoughts that the Scripture provides us about yes. the ideas. And here. what I'll say is the main thing that's incomplete about this is this idea that life on earth, you just live it, and then, boom, there's the, this, as Tim says, this surprise twist at the end. And guess what? You're going one of two places. You're going this way or that way, depending on whether you have the password. Whereas really the way that the biblical authors describe this idea of heaven and hell is actually more of a present state and reality, and maybe even a condition of your own heart or your okay, soul. Okay, this is huge right here. What we're talking about right here, when I came to understand this, this made so much sense, sense to me, is that heaven and hell are not just future places, they're present realities. Right, they are future places. Yes, they are. We're they not are denying real. future places. Right. Or, at, or the moment of judgment to come that you traditionally think of. But what we're talking about is that heaven and hell are much more a present reality as, as they're as much a present reality as they are a future Absolutely. destination. So we'll, we'll get started, I think, at the beginning, because I think part of the way we have to understand the afterlife is we have to understand sort of the nature of death and life itself to yes. begin with. Okay. So which sounds really complex. It's simpler than I think it sounds. If you go back to Genesis, we see that whenever God first makes mankind, he makes them out of dirt, and then he, he breathes his own divine breath, his presence into them, which animates Adam and eventually Eve out of Adam's body, and it makes these two living beings that are essentially composed of those two things. They're composed of, of dirt and divine breath, God's ruach, which is his, his, you know, his breath that sustains yeah. all things. Okay. Um, so a couple things to note. Number one, man is not inherently immortal, or eternal, we only are uh, eternal because of the divine breath of God that sustains us, which is a gift. Okay. So I think that's an interesting. So if it wasn't for the divine breath, we're just dirt. Yeah. So we, and we would return to dust, and and we would be over. Yes. But because God has breathed into us and made us in His image that way, we then have an eternal component to us. Absolutely. Well, and that's the that what you just said is the way that I would have said it before, but I think that's where there's sometimes a confusion. Okay. We talk about uh, the soul of a person. Right. The way I thought about this growing up was sort of like, okay, I'm a, I'm a person, and I have a body, and then I, there's this component of me that's like my soul or my spirit, right? It's like the inner person. Um, but the way the Bible talks about soul is actually it's just who you are. Okay. It's your essence. So there is a part of us that's spirit, um, but but the word I think they use in the Old Testament for this, I, I believe Tim says, is nefesh, which is, it sort of actually means your throat. It's where everything comes in and out of. Okay. And it's it's there. there's this idea that our soul is not separate from us. Um, we are our soul, 
And we were always actually meant to be joined together in both body and in spirit. God yeah. made us to be like that. And so when we talk about death, which comes in because of the curse of sin, it's this division, this schism that divides uh, our body and our spirit, which are separated. But I think so. Uh, but it's the, important to... but the end game, and this is another part that people don't understand, is that what we will finally be in heaven for all eternity is in a resurrected body. Yes, we are not a floating mist, unknowable that just sort of melds into God's universe. We're physical, just like we are here on Earth. In fact, that's part of what we see when Jesus is risen from the dead. His resurrected body, where he ate and was knowable and he could be touched, and he was flesh and bone. This is what we will be in heaven for all eternity, yeah. because God designed us in the Garden of Eden to be dust, physical, and ruach, divine breath, yeah. and he designed us in heaven eternally to be in a resurrected dust yeah. body, yeah. physical, and divine breath. Yes. And that is the state we are created for, yeah. not not a misty spirit that you know once you die you float around right but a real concrete knowable human being who will laugh and eat and enjoy life and this is this is how we've been designed to be and to yes. me that makes the angel with the halo on the cloud sort of pop away like it it fades <laughs> into oblivion okay yeah. that's not what i am and i'm not in an eternal church service i'll worship yeah. but i'm gonna be a lot like i am now yes exactly yeah exactly. so so that gives me like oh okay i i can hang with that concept yes right? well and and so there's some interesting things to understand about this because we're always meant to be in a physical body, death is actually what makes this unnatural condition where for a time we're separated just as a spirit. But that's not, it's not like, oh, we leave our old shell, our husk behind to become who we were meant to be, which is spirit. It's like, no, we are in a temporary state until we're re resurrected again in both yeah. body and in spirit. And okay. it's not just people that are going to heaven. It's actually at the end, at the final resurrection, everybody whether you are a part of God's covenant family or you're not, everybody will eventually be resurrected and reunited with their bodies. Yeah. Okay. That is a complicated topic you just cover right there. And that also blows people's mind. Yeah. So I know right now our listeners on the podcast are like, okay, slow down for a minute. <laughs> I need to get that again, but we're going to give that to you. This is actually what we're partially going to talk about in our next episode. Sure. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about heaven and its present reality, heaven in the permanent reality, the idea of where we go when we go to heaven, all of that stuff. We're going to come back to that, but let's put a pin in that for a moment Okay, and let's circle back to we were created to be dust and divine breath, and then sin enters the world. Right. So, so talk about the impact of that. So sin enters, enters the world, and there becomes this curse that you can read is in Genesis 3. three. Yeah. yeah, Genesis 3, where, you know, men is going to have to, you know, toil the ground and work and sweat, and women are going to have pain in childbirth, and... And then yeah. the relationship was separated and you have all kinds of fear and shame and anxiety and distance from God. And of course, with that package comes physical death, physical illness, death. sickness, right. abuse, war, division, hate, prejudice, injustice. All this enters a, the perfect world that God had created where his will was always being done with Adam and Eve in, in intimate fellowship with him constantly. And sin enters the world and brings the whole house of cards down and everything that was not the will of God enters the world that we live in now. And we see the suffering that comes with the curse of sin all around us. Yeah. And so what we are currently seeing, if we could say heaven looks a lot like the garden of Eden before the fall. Yeah. Hell looks a lot like the way that the world is today. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And both of those things are current realities in our world. They are. Okay. Heaven, which we no longer live in that state of God's per perfect will, is the dimension we are believing for the kingdom of heaven to come, the kingdom of God to come, for heaven to come back down to earth, for the earth to look again more like God's will, to look more like heaven. Yeah. But what we are living in in the current state is a place where God's will is most often not done, which then results in this condition of the world 
which is a lot like what hell is. It's exactly what, like what hell is. And so we, we talked about this at the beginning, but that heaven and hell are, you have to also think about them as present realities in our world. Yes. You know, the, the Lord's prayer ends with, you know, um, your will, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. You know, we're praying for a little bit of heaven right now here in the world. And so when we talk about this final judgment, well, I said, it, you know, at the beginning, the traditional view is there's this pastor moment that sort of comes at the end of your life when there's this unexpected twist. Boom. Do you know where you're going to die? You know, go, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, no. Like, I'm, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm going to hell, apparently. Like the, the, the way the Bible describes it is actually that that you are going to, you know, the, the trajectory of your life right now is just going to be locked into sort of a permanent state when you're judged at the end of all things. So if, if you are living now and you are rejecting God and you're rejecting, you know, his goodness and you are not wanting forgiveness and you really want hell, then eventually God is going to let you have what you want. Yeah. Okay. So let's describe this a little bit further. I actually think that hell is the condition of the world right now. Yeah. And hell is also the condition of many people's lives right now. So when you are separate from God, you're living empty, addicted, you're living tormented by the past, carrying around wounds. There are lies that you believe. Okay, all of that's true. In fact, some people who, who will say things like, I don't know that I believe in hell. I don't think a loving God would send anybody to hell. Okay, here's the reality. You would look at the world today and say, how can there be a loving God and there be abuse and human trafficking and racism and, you know, war and, um, I mean, you just rape and, and poverty and hunger. And I mean, we live in a place that is cursed everywhere you look, you see people who are suffering and you go to places in the world where you see intense suffering. This is the will of the devil being carried out on earth. And we live in a season where God said, okay, I'm going to give you a choice in the world. You can either cho choose me or you can choose your own way. If you choose your own way, you're going to get death. Death's going to come and reign in every way. And what, what we did and continue to do is choose our own way. And what we are getting as a result is the fallout of all of that. Yeah. And so we can see hell all around us. And what happens after death is that God then distanced himself even further from evil and, and he consumes it. And so therefore, hell gets worse, if yeah. we could say. It, so I have this quote from C.S. Lewis that we were referencing. Yeah, that's a good quote. Um, so here, here's what it says about God. God does not send anyone to hell. So this is from C.S. Lewis. Yeah, take it the, real slow so people catch this. In The Great Divorce. Okay. By the way, we have to recommend this book. The Great Divorce is sort of a work of fiction yeah. that describes this person that dies and it gets on sort of this tour bus yeah. that takes him through the afterlife and he goes down into hell and he sees what it's like there then he goes up into heaven and did you want to describe a little bit about like what hell is like when he's oh, yeah I so so okay c.s lewis he's the guy that wrote chronicles of narnia he's a great fiction writer wrote a great book called mere christianity oh, and wow. in this little book that's probably 140 pages really easy to read it's a fiction book it goes really fast he gives us some of these concepts of the condition of heaven and hell on earth today and then it becoming more permanent in the afterlife by describing the people who ended up without God for all eternity, trapped in their own sin, sin patterns. Yeah. Alcoholics constantly craving the next drink. But never being able to get it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, there's a woman who has now a ghastly figure who's always trying to get an, another man's attention but never can. So it's like whatever that primary dominant sin craving that is ruining you today you end up getting um, base, basically permanently captured by it for all eternity. Yeah. And, and, and then those who are uh, in heaven are those who are living in robust you know, bodies, enjoying life, uh, fu fully engaged. And you, you see the contrast of this in the way that he describes it. And I'm not doing it justice, so you need to read the full book yeah. to get that picture. But give us the C.S. Here, here's quote. this quote. He says, God, God created humans to have fellowship with him. And he has provided the means by which they can do so. It is a person's choice to experience uh, hell. His or his or uh, her own sin sends them there. That's actually from 
Uh, oh yeah, okay, that's Miller Erickson. And then it's uh, this. This is C.S. Lewis. Hell is God honoring human freedom to choose existence independent from their Creator. In the long run, the answer to those who object to the doctrine of hell itself is a question: What are they asking God to do? To wipe out past sins at all costs and give them a fresh start? He did that on the cross to forgive them, but they don't want forgiveness. To leave them alone, that's what hell is. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, it wouldn't be hell. Okay. Oh, it's like chilling. So two <laughs> different types of people. Those yeah. that say to God, thy will be done. I surrender to you. I want your way in my life, which then brings heaven into your into your heart, the Holy Spirit enters your life. He begins to do in you everything that is His will. Yeah. You either say, "God, Thy will be done," or God says to you, "Thy will be done." <laughs> Thy will, your will be done. Yeah, right. So you can have your way, and if you have your way, then you end up with the byproduct of your own choice, which is separation from God and all of the consequences of a selfish and sinful life. Right. So this is why. Uh, one of the most famous verses in in the Bible. So this is the the verse, right? We all know John three sixteen. This is the one where there's somebody behind the the field goal <laughs> apparatus with the John three sixteen sign in every football game. God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We know that part, right? Jesus died so that we would not perish eternally, but we would have eternal life. But then the next verse, Jesus says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. This is what we're yeah. saying, that hell is a condition that exists on earth already. It exists in your life already. And the world we live in is spiraling towards destruction and is stained with evil. Jesus entered the world to pull us out of that. Yeah. It wasn't like, so that's where, that's where earth is headed, towards judgment, towards destruction. And our lives are under the curse of sin and we're living in hellish con conditions today. Jesus is not condemning the world to hell. This is what it says in John 3, 17 and 18. But to rescue those of us who are headed for destruction and pull us out of that so that it doesn't have to be our destiny. We can actually experience heaven instead of hell. And so his death on the cross gives us a chance to be plucked out of that trajectory towards judgment and 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 being consumed by our selfishness and pulls us into a, a, an opportunity to get the will of God in our lives yeah. again and, the hev and heaven to come in our lives again. And so it's not like God is sending anybody to hell. It just is the current condition of the world that will continue on that trajectory trajectory until it becomes worse. And frankly, frankly, a, a big part of the gospel is something that we all deserve. Yeah. Because it's 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 just the Because the we've all chosen our own way. We've all chosen hell. And we've all yeah. seen the the consequences of that. And it's comp it's compounded because people every day are choosing their own way and there's eight billion of us doing it. Yeah. And we're and we're consuming one another. And we look at the world and we say, this place is messed up. God, why is it like this? Well, God's basically said, because I gave you a perfect world and you, and you chose your own way. And, and you continue to choose your own way. And if you would choose me, I could bring heaven on earth right now. Yeah. The dimension and will of heaven can come into your world right now. But you have to say, your will be done for that to happen. Yeah. And so the final moments are really God's just than making those choices permanent conditions. Right. And and so I think we do need to talk about that. So hell is, in some sense, a current reality, but it also is a future place. And yes. So when we talk about hell, a lot of the ideas that are wacky and that are off are actually somewhat based in, in, in biblical scripture. We yeah. talk about fire and darkness. But what, what we have to clarify with saying is that the uh, the language that's used to describe this real place is often figurative descriptive language. Yes. Meaning that, you know, in order to describe it, we're sort of at the end, the edges of human language, what we actually can describe. And so they're just doing their best, the biblical authors. And so, you know, uh, the, the two most common images are a place full of fire and a place full of darkness. Just as an example, you really can't, at least the way we think about it, you can't have some, somewhere totally dark and totally on fire yeah. because <laughs> fire is going to create light. So it's, it's yeah. not... 
that it won't be like that. But let's let's go into that for a moment because yeah. there are these images that we get, especially in the New Testament, is which we're, where we get the idea of what the destination. So we said the earth is in the condition of hell today. Yeah. But there is a, a final destination that we think of as hell that per, is the permanent place. Right. And the and New Testament gives us a couple images. One is what I mentioned earlier, the lake of burning fire, yeah. Revelation chapter 20. The devil and his demons are cast there and are consumed. And then anyone whose name is not found written in the book of life, it says is sent there. Now, here's the challenge with the book of Revelation. Most of the book of Revelation is written as ap, 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 what is it? Apocalyptic. apocalyptic yeah. <laughs> I had a hard time with that word for a moment. Apop, apocalyptic literature, which is like prophetic science fish, fiction, if we can say it like that. Sure. So in, in the book not of Revelation. Not that it's not real. But no, it's, it's imagery yeah, exactly. that conveys a meaning. What we don't know, what nobody knows about the book of Revelation is which of the images are literal and which of them are figurative. So when we look at the lake of burning sulfur, is that intended as a figurative image or as a literal image? We've always taken it as literal, but you can't do that with the book of Revelation. You have to at least have a humble hesitance about defining everything literally. Well, I think we, we talked about this, how, you know, People often will use figurative and literal wrong. They'll they'll say, what do you say? Like somebody would say, they're a, like a fireball. Yeah, yeah. Like my wife is a fireball. Okay. You could say my wife is literally a fireball. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. no, she's, no not. she's not literally. <laughs> she's figuratively yeah. a fireball. There might be passion that you see there, but it isn't literal. Like ah, she's going through this, <laughs> the sky, right? Okay. Yeah. So we don't know if this is literal or figurative, but we do know it conveys some things. It's a place of of you know consuming like a fire does and it's designed for evil um as a final judgment on the evil that has been present in the world all along right fire cleanses yeah. it burns away chaff and impurities it, it can burn garbage actually that's one of the things that, that we see jesus talk about is he often references when we're talking about fire imagery he often re references this valley of sheol yes Right. So, yeah. So the Valley of Sheol was a place just outside of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is at a, a high peak and then there's it goes down into a valley and back up onto another mountain. One of the little valleys just outside of Jerusalem was the Valley of Sheol, which in the Old Testament was the place where they sacrificed their children to false Redeeming gods. Demon God. Yeah. To Molech. So it's a place of demonic darkness and then over time became a place that we know as Gehenna, another word Jesus used for that place, which was like a gar garbage dump. Yeah. So it's a place of refuse, burning trash, stench, filth, um, demonic darkness. So then you get Revelation, fire. Um, it's not a place you want to be, right? There actually, there actually is a garbage dump like this that you and I have both been to in Nicaragua, yeah. where people actually live and forage for things that they can sell and yeah. there are fires burning everywhere and it's smoky and it's stenchy and it's filled with trash. And you could say that that would be like the Gehenna Jesus described. So when he talks about you're in danger of the fires of hell, he would have been in, in talking about the idea, the imagery of people understanding Valley of Sheol or Gehenna. So yeah. those are the pictures that we have that we get in the New Testament. Yeah. It's actually really interesting. You also hear about this called Gehenna, right? I don't know if you said that or not. The, yes, the, Gehenna. The Gehenna, which is a, uh, it's a Hebrew, it's it's a Greek pronunciation of a Hebrew word, Gai Ben Hinnom, which is this Valley of Hinnom, which, I mean, so there's this whole prophecy, I won't go into it, but it's, it's from Jeremiah, where he says, you know, because of what you've done, sacrificing your children i am going to to slaughter you and leave you know thousands of corpses in this valley and they're going to be fed on by birds and he has all this imagery and it's like you know that's really intense but god's like well don't sacrifice children yeah well, you know this well, is you know, okay so this is another thing a big part of us wants there to be judgment yeah for injustice in the world in fact our our generations are longing for justice. Yeah. This is actually one of the big themes that things, people who do things that are harmful to others should one day be held account yeah. to account. We want a God who's not just going to let, you know, serial murderers get away with it. Yes. We want a God who's not going to let child sacrifice go unpunished. Right. So, 
um, there, there must be justice in the world or else we're just living in an empty place with no meaning. And what God is saying is there is a Valley of Sheol. There is a, a moment of judgment. There is a Gehenna. There is a, a place of burning fire. Yeah. We don't know exactly whether it's a trash heap or a lake of fire, but we do know it's like unto that. That's what it, the, all of these are metaphors to describe. If you end up trapped in the permanent condition of hell on earth and you are then separated from God for all eternity, it will feel dark. It, it will feel oppressive. It will feel lonely. Um, it will feel hot. I mean, this is not going to be a, a good thing to be permanently encapsulated oh, right. in what we know to be hell today for all eternity, where God is more separate from what we experience here well, on and earth right now. I think right this now. is important to talk about because a lot of times people think of hell as being, so I've heard it described like this, there's this, like hell is a problem because if God's good, let's say at the end of all things, how can there be this perfect creation, this perfect uh -huh. kingdom yeah. with this torture chamber right in the middle where God is just, you know, mutilating people? Like that sounds awful. How can a good God be like that? But the the way that, so first of all, Jesus talks about this a lot. Yes. But also the, the way that it's described is not like God is some sadistic person that gets his kicks by punishing people who are evil. <laughs> right, exactly. This is, this is really a, a state that's in your heart now that if you are judged and you are not a part of the family of God and you are not you have not been transformed raised back to life but you already are in spiritual death you'll continue on in spiritual death um so you go so ahead. it's like God says I'm not going to have anything to do with this any longer yes. if you have said my will be done not yours God I'm going to let you have your way and I'm going to now walk away for this for all eternity but God so desperately doesn't want people stuck in that condition that he sent his own son in the body of Jesus to come into the world on a rescue mission and to die a brutal death on a cross to pay for your sin and to give you by his resurrection a chance for heaven on earth and after this life because God desperately does not want you to stay in this condition yeah. that you're in today. And he doesn't want you to be permanently sealed in that condition. And how much more could he do to express to us how much he loves us and wants us out of that condition than to give his own son to die on the cross for us. Absolutely. So the idea of a good God, so God shows his goodness in Jesus and through the cross. He can't do anything about the fact that some people choose to say, I don't want anything to do with you, God. He can't, he can't change that because he gave us, free, gave us free will. He can only give us an opportunity out of what we've chosen so that we have a fresh start and a chance for life and for heaven and for eternal life. And so, so the love of God is demonstrated through the cross. Yeah. And my hope is, if you're listening to this and you're not sure where you stand with God, that you first of all realize you need him in your life today so that what is hell on earth for you now doesn't have to be that way anymore. Not only can he forgive the slate of your sin in the past, but he can enter your life. The Holy Spirit can enter your life and give you life and bring heaven into your world today so that when you die, you have confidence that just like you have heaven in your life today, you're going to have it for all eternity, minus all of the hellish suffering we see around us. Yeah, there, there's a lot more we could go into as far as descriptions that Jesus gives you know, as far as the isolation, darkness, you're not going to be at the feast. You'll be weeping. There's all this other stuff we can go into. Yeah, like but he I, says, where there'll be weeping and constant regret because you'll you'll be gnashing your teeth. I mean, yeah. that is, man, it, so it is, There's, it's a heavy thing. It should compel us now as followers of Jesus to say, we have to do something about the situation on the earth today. Yeah, that's where I was just about to go. And But we also have to do something about the fact that there are so many people that have never heard the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. Mm -hmm. There's unreached people groups that have never heard the gospel before. There are people that really don't have a clear understanding of the gospel who live right near us today. And we don't want to see people live in the condition of hell now nor do we want to see them sealed in it for all eternity. Well, the, the other thing it has to prompt us to do is just to really ask a, a self-examining question, which I understand you can take that too far. I'll mention how I did as a kid in a second. But I do think because this is not just a password moment, if you've prayed a prayer, you're good. If you got baptized, you're good. This is really a, a condition, and, and 
following Jesus is being transformed, resurrected to spiritual life. Yeah. So it does cause us to examine ourselves. Yeah, and like say, Jesus said, you'll know by their fruit. You'll know by their fruit. So, some will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do all this great stuff? And I'll say, you weren't like me at all. You didn't really let heaven enter your life at all. You didn't follow me. Yeah. You, you prayed a prayer. You talked the talk. Yeah. Now I'll say, so you can take that too far. Yeah, we're not trying to create a insecurity in panic. you. Dad, when I was 11, but that had, password moment sometimes has created this weak sense of all I have to do is just say the magic words rather than truly let Jesus come into my life and, exactly. and rule over me. But go yeah. ahead. Well, so when I was 11, I had probably six months. I genuinely think of them where I tortured myself. Not an exaggeration. I thought about it every day, all day. From I don't even know what sparked us, but I thought I was definitely going to hell. And I didn't know what to do about it because I just like was like, I can't, you know, like. I, I was reading about the unpardonable sin, which that's the thing we don't have to go into here. And maybe I've committed this. That would be and... a good pod, follow-up podcast <laughs> episode. At some point, yeah. <laughs> Especially maybe after we just mess with people right sin, now. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm going to be able to go to heaven. And, I, I mean, I was sick over this all the time. I think that we are not, like, if you are someone who has been resurrected into a new life and you're following Jesus, you don't have to be freaked out. You know, the Bible says nothing can snatch you out of his hand. Yes. That, that you are held tightly by and you're God. And you're not going to heaven because you changed yourself or because you were perfect or because you did it perfect. You're doing it simply because you allowed, you allowed Jesus into your life when you became born again. You became born spiritually. How you know that you are right with God is that the Holy Spirit on the inside of you testifies to you. This is what it says in Romans. The Spirit of God testifies to our spirit that we are God's children, that we're born spiritually, that the Ruach of God has been breathed into us again by the Holy Spirit. And he's taken us from spiritual emptiness and death inside to spiritual life and that our sins are forgiven and it's all because of the cross. So it's not like you've earned it. You didn't earn it when you got saved. You didn't earn it to, to stay saved. It's all a gift and it all comes by faith. Absolutely. But you know it because the Spirit of God tells you that on the inside. And when he when he confirms to you that you are born again, don't doubt it. Don't go go around like you like you said and torture yourself that somehow now you that is all undone in you. Yes. And yet work out your own salvation. Yeah, be be you know, this is something that you need to know. Yes. Like this is don't just be confident in a couple of words you said in a church service. Just know that you are. We're actually commanded yeah. to do that. Work out your own, isn't it? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah. So because it, it's God who works in you to willing to do according to His good pleasure. There you go. <laughs> so you can't do it all on your own, but God has to do it in you. But you you need to be aware: Is God saving me? Has yes, He done this in you. my life? Great. And and you need to to press into that. And if you are dealing with fear or anxiety about it, don't do what Dave did and try to handle <laughs> it on his own. Sure. Right. Talk to somebody who can help walk you through that into a place of assurance yeah. of your salvation. So in summary, in summary, hell is a real place, but it's not the place that maybe you grew up thinking it was. Um, well, because we don't know exactly. We only have imagery, right? Right, but it, it's also not the traditional view of you die, and if you did the password, you're good. And if right. not, you know, hell is also a present reality. Um, it's also good to summarize that someday all of us will be resurrected again to be in our in our physical bodies. Yes. And if you are a follower of Jesus, that you'll spend eternity in heaven. And that hell is actually just a necessary consequence of God allowing people to make the choice to reject him rather than to actually follow him and to love him the way that we all have a chance to do anyway. Yeah. God always has his will in the Garden of Eden, and it's perfect. He always has his will in the new heaven and a new earth we hear about in the book of Revelation 21 and 22. In between, the will of man and women, men and women, and the will of the devil happens on earth. It does. In eternity where we are in hell or separated from God, we get our way. The devil gets his way. Yeah. Heaven, God gets his way. By the way, in the next episode, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the idea of heaven now. And we're going to talk about where people go and what that actually looks like. Actually, Revelation talks about new heaven and new earth. So we won't go there yet. But I will just say as a little tease that, again, eternity will look a lot more like what it looks like for us now yeah. than we the realize. The best parts. The best parts. Absolutely. And so the mystical parts of what we imagine about heaven are probably, uh, there's probably more concrete nature to what you will understand about what you're, what you're going to be and where you're going than what you know right now. Right. And so that's just a little tease for the next episode. And especially if you've had a loved one who's recently passed 
and you're wondering where they are, what's happening, this next podcast that we do um, will maybe something you might want to forward to friends. Actually, both of these. If you have someone you're concerned about or has the question about he heaven and hell, this first one would be something for them to listen to. But the next one, I think, might be of great comfort to a lot of people yeah. when we start to talk about the, what the Scripture teaches about So let's about end heaven. on sort of concluding the question that we started with about yeah. the church going silent. So what do we do as a church? Not just, I mean, as Allison Park Church, yes, but what, what should the church do in terms of addressing our silence on this topic? Yeah, I think we have to start to talk about it again as a condition that we all live in. And we have to also continue to talk about the reality that, that there is justice in the world, that there is justice, that we serve a holy God of justice. And then we have to try to do it in such a way that every time we talk about it, it does a little bit of work. We do a little bit of work to try to distance ourselves from the angry God imagery and the Dante's Inferno imagery and the sort of cartoonish versions of the cloud and the fire pit with the devil in a red suit kind of a thing and bring more of the biblical concepts in as we teach out of the scriptures so that we can face this consequence. Because if, if there is no justice or judgment and we don't look at the real realities of the condition of the world today, then we sort of live in a sort of a fluffy version of Christianity that isn't really grounded in something. I and we don't come to under appreciate the cross. I think we also have to get a little more comfortable with the uncomfortable uncomf parts of the Bible. Yeah. Because, I mean, it, it's, it's not like there's a way to explain this. Like, oh, it's just a big misunderstanding. Yeah. I, I mean, there, there is this idea of God's judgment, which is a good part of God, and God's wrath even, mm -hmm. which is a good part of God. And they're uncomfortable for us to talk about. But I think if we're going to really make disciples, if we're going to be disciples— we have to sit and be able to wrestle through some of these things and not just... Just like with everything them. else in the world, right? Yes. The world is not crying out for simplified answers. Yeah. Um, actually, there there was... I'm, I hesitate to bring this up because it. I know some people might have found great value in this particular thing. But we actually uh, hosted an event called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames, which was very famous for traveling around the world where a lot of people gave their lives to Christ. And it was this... It was a whole drama of the password moment. Yeah, right. There is there is a a devil on the on the stage, and he wants you, and he wants to take you to hell. And there's there's a <laughs> you know a stairway into heaven. And so we actually e exaggerated some of the oversimplification of that moment. Yeah. In that particular drama, do you remember? I'll that? never forget like Greg Jacobs, the devil <laughs> beer commercials, <laughs> my greatest tool. <laughs> yeah. So. I think we are probably trying to undo some of the oversimplification of that right. teaching without losing the reality, because we are not in any way saying there is no hell. We are saying there is, yeah. but, but we need to understand it from, more from a biblical perspective, or else we end up putting these questions in people's mind, minds like, well, how can God be good if there is a hell? Hopefully we resolve that issue, that God is good. And yeah. He loves you so much, and he so desperately does not want you to remain in the condition of hell or end up in the destination of hell. He wants you to be saved and experience every good thing that he has for you, is which is what we call heaven. And so, um, but yes, I know we have our work cut out for us as pastors and leaders to do a better job at this. Yeah. Well, hopefully we get a sermon series at some point this year. That's what, yeah. I'm, that's what I'm keying into. So Heaven, what? Hell, and the Afterlife okay. at APC. That would be good. That would be fun. So, well, I know this is a somber episode, um, but it's one that I think we all have to grapple with the reality of and to then go on mission for, because that's what the church is here for, is to bring heaven to earth and to help, help people meet Jesus, who's the person that does bring spiritual life and transformation. So, And if you have questions or you need to talk based upon this episode, please reach out to us. We would love to engage with you in any way we can. Absolutely. As always, we just want to say thank you so much for joining us, and you would do us such a great service if you could like and subscribe on YouTube or share on social media, or as always, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, that just helps us to spread the word and let more people know about the And we're resource. so glad that so. we actually pressed play on this episode and it was recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, so hey, thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you guys next time.